Well, today uh, we're going to try to do two things. One, I want to honor dads because it's Father's Day. Uh, and the other thing is I have to, to wrap up our series on eldership. And so I've got to try to tie those two things together, and I'll do my best to make that happen. Uh, but before we do, I just want to uh, draw your attention to, remember Matthew chapter 6, when the disciples were asking Jesus if he would teach them how to pray? I remember that. And, and Jesus said, hey, when you pray, don't pray like the other people do out in the streets and the people who just want to use fancy words and eloquent speeches and, you know, they want to draw attention to them. So don't, don't pray that way. He said, when you pray, go off to a quiet place where it's just you and your heavenly father. And when you pray, you should pray this way. And uh, we are a church that believes Jesus didn't mean to necessarily use the exact words he spoke every single time you pray, although there's nothing wrong with that. But we believe that Jesus was giving us a, a formula or a model for how we ought to pray. But if you remember, he started the prayer this way. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Isn't it amazing? That of all the relationships God could have chosen to have with you and me, he, he could have chosen your highness who is in heaven, our king who is in your majesty. And all those would be right and fitting because our God is a king and he is Lord and he is beyond anything we can imagine. He is worthy of all of our praise, all of our worship, all of our reverence, and yet still he chooses the relationship of our Father. And, and when we pray, and I pray the words, our Father in Heaven, it, it just gives me this um, connection and this understanding and this humility that I get to come before God as a beloved child. Not only created by, but redeemed by, and loved by, and rescued by, and supported by, and delighted in by the God of the universe. And Jesus said when we pray, we should pray our Father. And that means it, it's not a, a, a me prayer, it's an us prayer. All of us together have a Father in heaven. And coming from Jesus, it means even more. Because Jesus said our, and that means I'm united with Jesus as a son of the living God. And you and I get to Talk to our Father in heaven. Be loved by our Father in heaven. Be cherished by our Father in heaven. And so I say happy Father's Day to all of you who are dads. Um, happy Father's Day to those of you who are about to become dads. And uh, we recognize that there are people here today who will remember their own dads. And some of you will remember your dad with a great big smile. And it will warm your heart. Because you had this awesome, tremendous dad. For some of you, he's still with you. And for some of you, he's gone on to be with the Lord. Some of you had dads that, that weren't the world's greatest dads. And so there's, there's a different kind of feeling. And, and we want to honor you all too. And, and we'll kind of circle back to that at, at the end. But no matter what, we have a father in heaven who is a perfect father who loves us dearly, and who desires to be in a real relationship with each and every one of us. You know, there was a young man who uh, uh, lived in the 1800s. He, he, he wrote down his account, his story, and this young man uh, was down by the creek one day, and uh, his father met him at the creek, and he said, now son, did you push our outhouse into the creek? And the son said, uh, Dad, actually, I did. I, I pushed the outhouse into the creek. And you know how dads are. He said, now, what would have possessed you? Why on earth would you have thought that was a good idea? Why would you push our outhouse into the creek? I mean, what even came over you? Why would you push the outhouse into the creek? And so they're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the son can tell that the father's really upset about this whole thing. And the son is thinking, like, it's just a prank. It's not that big a deal. Like, ha-ha, Dad, it was just a joke. It was funny. But, but then they start getting into, like, consequences. And the son says, hey, whoa, whoa, Dad, hold on, hold on. Uh, you know, George Washington told the truth when he cut down his father's cherry tree. And George Washington get, didn't get in any trouble. To which the father replied, yeah, but George Washington's father wasn't in the tree. <laughs> uh, three quarters of you got it. Did you want to explain it? Explain it? Okay, you got it. All right, good. <laughs> well, 
we don't know if that story about George Washington and the cherry tree was, was true. In fact, uh, most historians believe that's probably just a myth and not really true. But there are some things that are true about dads. And so if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up to Psalm 127. It's not a very long psalm. It's a short one. Psalm 127. If you don't have your Bible, you'll be able to follow along on the screens up here. But we always encourage you to have your Bible so you can circle and underline and take notes and highlight. By the way, i got to tell you something while you're turning there. I, I, I heard a, um, one of the preachers that I enjoy this week giving an account of something that he and his dad do, and I thought this is really, really cool. It takes some, some forethought and some planning, uh, but what this father, uh, the, the, the patriarch in the family, what he does for all the young men in the family is as each one of them are getting close to being 13, 14 years old, uh, this father and grandfather, he goes and he buys a Bible. And he spends about the next two years during all of his own personal Bible study and devotional time, and he just highlights, and he underlines, and he circles, and he writes down notes, and he writes his prayers right there in the Bible. And then when that child turns 13 or 14 years old, this father and grandpa, he, he, he makes a, a day of it, and he delivers that Bible to that particular child. And he says, this is now yours. And it's got all of Grandpa's highlights and notes and underlines and prayers. And I just thought that was really, really cool. And just another uh, reason why we ought to be marking up our Bibles. In Psalm 127, we see these words. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builder is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night anxiously working for food to eat for God gives rest to his loved ones children are a gift from the Lord they are a reward from him children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands how joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them he will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates you may have heard this psalm, and you may have heard a, a preacher preach it, and uh, he talks about the, the arrows, and he uses the word here, a quiver. Uh, some of you know what a quiver is. A quiver is apparently uh, something that holds arrows. So when the warrior goes out into to the battle, uh, the warrior has a, um, a, a leather pouch on his back with a belt, and he puts the arrows inside so that he can use those arrows for, for fighting. And most times when preachers preach this, they talk about what a blessing it is to have children. They talk about what a blessing it is to, to have many arrows in your quiver. And for those of us who have children, we know that it's true. Children are an incredible blessing. Children are incredibly wonderful and awesome, and they bring joy to our lives. And children are really hard and frustrating and annoying, and they make us gray. Right? And so it's all of that together. The, the psalmist starts out here in verse 1. He said, unless the Lord builds a house, the, the work of the house or the builder is wasted. He goes on and he says, it's not just a house. And unless the Lord protects a city, look, guarding it with, with all your centuries doesn't even matter. It's not going to help for it is the Lord who protects the city. And so the psalmist here is, is, is telling us that, that it is God who is uh, the foundation of the house. It is God who is the foundation of the city. Now, some of you may know that uh, there is a, a building in San Francisco. It's called Millennium Tower. Anyone here ever seen Millennium Tower in San Francisco? Anybody? No? Okay. No, most educated church. All right. Uh, <laughs> If you have seen it, or if you've seen pictures, what you find out about Millennium Tower is that it is actually a leaning tower. Not the leaning tower of Pisa, but we have a leaning tower uh, right here in the United States. It is in San Francisco, and it is indeed Millennium Tower. And what we know is that the reason why Millennium Tower is leaning is because San Francisco, at least much of San Francisco, is actually built on landfill. Much of the, the, the city of San Francisco and a lot of the buildings is built on, on landfill. 
And any uh, architect knows, or anyone who watches those uh, disasters, engineering disasters programs on Discovery Channel, you'll know that when you build a high-rise building, you have to take the foundation down to bedrock. You've got to get it on, on solid rock, on a firm foundation. And if you just try to build your building on landfill, what will happen is that that foundation will eventually sink in and get lopsided and tilt, and your building will lean. And that's exactly what happened with Millennium Tower in San Francisco. The builders, the architects, the engineers, they, they did not dig uh, pylons all the way down to the bedrock, and, and that building is now leaning. The reason I bring that up to you is this. I think we have the same thing happening in families in our time all around us, where families are not building their homes on a solid foundation, on, on, on a firm foundation, the solid rock. And what's happening is that our families are beginning to lean and tilt. And they're twisting and they're cracking and they're crumbling. And that's what the psalmist says here. He said, look, unless you build your house on the Lord, or unless the Lord is your architect, the work of the builder is wasted. And he said that same thing is true for entire cities. It's interesting that this particular psalm is a part of a group of psalms. Uh, and that group of psalms is called the, the Songs of Ascent. The Songs of Ascent. A-S-C-E-N-T. The Songs of Ascent. And, and so these particular psalms, I think there are 15 of them, they are a group of songs that would have basically been uh, the, the, the playlist for Israelites who were coming to worship. And, and many of you know that when Israelites came to worship, they would go to Jerusalem, which essentially sits atop a mountain, right? And so they would have to climb up from the east, the west, the north, the south. They, they would have to ascend or climb up as they were going to this place for worship. And during that ascent, during the journey up that mountain, they would sing these psalms out loud. You know, it's interesting, when, when we go on a trip anywhere now, I have to tell my boys, look, there are limits to your devices. Um, some of you may have similar situations. When, when you go on a road trip with your family today, uh, our, our kids, they have their, their smartphones, or they have their Nintendo Switch, or they have their iPad. They've got all this kind of entertainment. Uh, some of us, we didn't have that when we used to go on family trips. Uh, I remember in, I think it was 1987, my dad purchased a conversion van, which is kind of historic now amongst the youth group. And my one son, he so badly wants that, that conversion van, that 1987 Chevy conversion van, when he turns 16. He's dead set on it, he wants that, but that, that van had a little TV in it. Uh, that TV screen, I mean, it was all of about this big. <laughs> And it got a black and white picture, and it was fuzzy and staticky at best. But man, we thought we had arrived when we had that thing. And I remember one year, uh, we went with another family, and they, they got a van, and that van had a video game in it. And we thought we had arrived. But before that, we used to go on trips to uh, Minnesota, and we would just sit in the back of my dad's car. And so one of us would lay across the seat, and one of us would lay across the floor in the back seat, you guys remember when the floor in the back seat used to have a hump? Yeah. Some of you remember that? You remember the hump? And the hump was hot. The hump got hot. Some of you, if you're not that old, you don't remember. I don't know, was it, you car guys, was it a muffler under the, what was under the hump? The drive shaft. The drive shaft. Well, apparently the drive shaft gets hot. Because my brother and I used to fight over who would get to sit on, uh, sit on the seat and then who would get to sit down on the... Uh, uh, on the drive shaft. <laughs> and yeah, it got hot. And if you were really lucky, uh, sometimes, mom, dad, I'm sorry to put you out there like this, uh, but before we had car seats and before we had to wear seatbelts, every once in a while, you would sit up in the back window. So you did too? You had bad parents too, yeah. We would go up on that ledge and you would sit in that window and you would just get baked. Uh, with no sunscreen on, and this greenhouse effect by the rays coming into the car. And if it was a far enough trip, you would be sunburned before you even got there. And that's where the speakers for the radio were. Well, to, today, you know, our kids have all this entertainment things, but in, in this time, 
they sang songs together. And it wasn't just a way to pass the time. It wasn't, you know, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. It wasn't that. These were songs of worship to prepare the hearts of God's people for their arrival at the place of worship. And this particular psalm falls into that, that, that song of ascent category. And so the people would literally sing this song as they were moving toward the place where they would worship God. Singing about God as their firm foundation. Singing about how the house and the city and the family and the community has to be built by the Lord. And of course they would talk about or sing about the children who are a blessing. They would sing about their dads in this song. Some of you remember an actor named Burt Reynolds? Mm -hmm. Burt Reynolds, at the height of Burt Reynolds' popularity, I don't know if you'd be aware of this, but at the height of his popularity, Burt Reynolds was earning $1 million per week. That, that was his earning. He was earning a million dollars per week, and while earning a million dollars per week, was uh, no, noted as the sexiest man in America. So he's making a million dollars a week, He's, he's driving, uh, I think it was a Trans Am, is that right? The Trans Am, right, with the bird on the front? And, and, and he's the sexiest man in America, where all the ladies think, I mean, he, he's something special, uh, especially with that, that chest hair popping out, and the gold chains, and man, he was something special. And yet, for everything that he had going for him, do you know that Burt Reynolds once in an interview said this? He said, Sexiest man in America, million dollars a week, movies, popularity, fame, fortune. He said, all that's great. I would kill for a hug from my father. Yeah. So I traded all in for a hug from my father. And, and I've been very privileged over the years to, to work with lots and lots of different athletes, work with lots and lots of different students, work with lots and lots of uh, students even here in our youth group at the church. And church, I can't even count for you or begin to give you a list of the number of young people who have at some point said to me, Coach, Pastor Rick, Mr. Tustin, you have been more of a dad to me than my own father ever was. Which is really tragic. And it breaks my heart. And I'm like, well, Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you that I've been able to have a positive impact on, on these people's lives. But, but here's the reality. The reality is this. Now that I have my own sons, and now that I'm pouring into them, and I know how much I give to them, and I think of what I gave to those students and athletes, it was nothing compared to this. And they thought that was something. And it just reminds me of how incredibly important dads are. And I think it's one of the reasons why God chose to relate to you and me as father and child. Because he wants us to understand how incredibly important that relationship is. You know, it's interesting when we talk about the foundations and building on, on um, bedrock, or building on landfill. Now, there are so many things that we're building on that we might call landfill today. And, and, and listen, I, I'm going to teach right now, not from a position of getting it right, but from a perspective of walking through it right now and continuing to make mistakes as I walk through it. Think of some of the things that, that we, we are, are making our foundations. For some of us, it, it's athletics. Our family right now and some of the other families I know, we're really trying to navigate like all the games and the schedules and the camps and the, the cost and, 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 and out of town and all these different things. And for some others, it might be dance or for some others, it might be music. And like These are all worthwhile endeavors. They're all good things, right? But, but to, to, at some point, we've got to say, wait a minute, it's, it's not the best thing. It's not the highest thing. It's not the most important thing. And, and when we build our lives and things like that up, for others it might be, be school and grades. And like, yeah, that's good. That's important. 
Sometimes I've joked about how, oh, you know, school's not that important and grades don't matter that much. Actually, they do. School's important, education's important, getting good grades, success is important, but it's not the most important thing. It's not the highest thing. And, and, and so what is our foundation? What are we actually building on for our families, for our homes? And that thing has to be God. It has to be our faith. It has to be the gospel. It has to be the truth of Scripture. You know, when I think about some of those young people that, that I've had the privilege to impact in a positive way, th there's one word in particular that always resonates with them. One word. And it, they, they've told me often, it, it's that one word. And here it is. And I know that we have lots of dads in this room who say it. And I know we have lots of dads who say it often, but I just want to tell you, we can't say it often enough. The word is proud. You know, we, we kind of got it up here in the video, right? That's a funny video. That was pretty funny. That was good. It was almost as funny as those, uh, I think, Geico commercials or something where you're turning into your dad. Right? Those are good, too. This, this is a funny video, but at the end where it, it, it turns and it gets a little bit more serious, there's like that mic drop moment where the dad says, I am proud of you. You know, in, in Scripture, there's two times where, where our Father in Heaven verbally says, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. I'm proud of Him. I'm proud of Him. And do you know that the first time God says that is when Jesus is being baptized. And if you think about it, at that point, Jesus has not begun his adult ministry. He's not performed a miracle. He's not preached a sermon. He's not risen from the dead. And before he's done any of that, God wants to make clear to everybody, this is my son and I'm proud of him. Not for what he's done, because he hasn't done it yet. I'm proud of him because he is my son. Dads, we need to let our sons know and our daughters know that we are proud of them. Not in every situation, because by the way, that landfill can be filled with some of the false stuff, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But there are times when we need to let them know, man, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the person you are. I'm proud of the character you have. I, I, I'm proud of our, our family. I'm proud of you. And not just for your accomplishments, but I'm proud of you. You. Proverbs 13.22 says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You know, essentially what the, the proverb is saying is that as, as fathers, we're, we're not only thinking about our children, but we're thinking generational. You're right, we're thinking about our, our, our grandchildren and maybe even uh, our, our great-grandchildren. I just got to go around and shake some hands when uh, the worship team took a break and we were saying Happy Father's Day. And I got back there to Mr. Allgood and I said, Hey, Happy Father's Day and Happy Grandfather's Day and Happy Great-Grandfather's Day. And I thought I covered all of it. And somebody goes, No, no. And Happy Great-Great-Great-Grandfather's Day. Yeah. We're not only thinking about our children, but our children's children. And in the proverb, it talks about an inheritance. And yes, we are wise if we're thinking about our investments, and we're thinking about uh, uh, having a will, and we're thinking about our, our, our property, our assets, and the things that we will leave to our children. No doubt we're, we're, we're wise to do those things. But you know, there's another investment. There's a, a more important investment that we make into our children and our children's children, and that is the investment of the truth of who God is and, and, and how God loves them and how he will forgive sins if you place your faith in Jesus Christ. When we read this particular psalm, it talks about arrows. It says that our children are like arrows. Children are like arrows, and arrows are to be held in your hand. Arrows are to be held in your hand in the same way that, that our children are to be held in our hands. Dads, we're to hold our children in our hands. 
Uh, there's a story of, of Charles and Henry Brooks. And uh, the, the two of them, Charles was the dad and Henry was the son, and they went out fishing. They spent an entire day. They carved out time on their calendar, and uh, they went and spent an entire day fishing. And uh, afterward, each of them wrote in their journals. And the father, Charles, he wrote this. Uh, he, he said, went fishing, spent the entire day at the lake fishing, caught nothing. Really frustrating. Here's what his son Henry wrote. Alexis, can you show him? Henry wrote this. Went fishing today with my father. Maybe get an extra today. Went fishing today with my father. The most glorious day of my life. Went fishing today with my father. Didn't catch a thing. Most glorious day of my life. This is a father who spent time with his child. Because presence is powerful. Presence is powerful, right? Being there, being with your child, spending time with your child is powerful. And I just want to press down on that a little bit if you'll allow me to. It's not about proximity, it's about participation. Right? We don't just want the dad who's in the room. We want the dad who is engaged. We don't just want the dad who's nearby, but we want the dad who's pouring out and pouring into, paying attention. Because dads, we lead not from a, power, a, a, a place of position, but from relationship. Right, dads, we, we, we lead from a place of relationship, and it has to be that day because we cannot impact deeply anyone with whom we do not have genuine intimacy. Let me say that again. We cannot impact deeply anyone with whom we do not have genuine intimacy. We have to build meaningful relationships with our children. Moms, I know many of you do that, and you do that well. Dads, we have to do the same. Here's another thing about these arrows. The psalmist talks about arrows. Um, well, when somebody fires an arrow, uh, it goes fast, doesn't it? Arrows go fast. In fact, they, they, they fly by. And it, if you think about the time we have with our children, it goes fast. Some of you would even say, it flies by. And I know that some of you are in a place where you're going, you know what, it's not going fast enough. It's not flying by today. Uh, there, there's one person who said this, parenting, when it comes to parenting, the days are long, but the years are short. The days are long, but the years are short. And um, I know that there are many of you in here who have adult children. Now, you may even have grandchildren, and you would probably affirm that and say, you know, it did go by fast. In fact, it went by too fast. By the way, if you feel like it went by too fast, is there anybody in here who just shouted an amen today? Amen. Yeah. It goes by fast. You know, we're in a place where you know that we have a, a 10, 12, and 14-year-old, so they're not even fully grown. Uh, but as I look at them and we go through old pictures and videos and things, and I look back and I think, where did that time go? How, how did we get to this place? It was, it was like yesterday. Another person said this, they said, our influence over our sons lasts only until they can smell gasoline and perfume. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how that works for daughters, but our influence over our son lasts only until they can smell perfume and gasoline. So where's the wisdom in that? The wisdom in that is here. The wisdom is to mark moments. In, in this time that's like arrows flying by fast and, and going by quickly, take time out to mark moments. Take time out to celebrate accomplishments. But take time out also to teach. And remember when I said I'm not here to preach at you because I'm still in this? Listen, one of the things that I wish I could go back and do over right now is to do a little bit better job of, of, of teaching the kids that they have some responsibility in, that they have some ownership over, that they have to take part in. I haven't done a very great job of that. I forget the exact quote, but somebody said uh, something along these lines, that consumption without contribution 
is entitlement. Consumption without contribution is entitlement. And so this, this foundation that we're laying, this bedrock that we're laying, has a lot to do with helping our kids understand, you got to contribute, you got to be a part of it. You know that pastor I was telling you about that I was listening to what he said, and he had some good things to say about dads? Here's what his dad did. It was the same guy that uh, bought the Bible and marked it up and gave it to each of the kids when they turned 13. Here's what his dad did with him. When, when this young man graduated from uh, high school, his dad had a, a, a party. They had a graduation party. And then at one point in the party, the dad said, son, I want you to meet me outside on the sidewalk. And, and so they met outside on the sidewalk, and apparently the, the father had a place setting from the dinner table. And, and he had this place setting, and when the son came out there, the dad was smiling, and he was holding the place setting. And when the son said, all right, dad, here I am. I, you know, what's going on? What, what's the place setting? The father picked it up high, and then he smashed it on the ground. And the son said, uh, Dad, what are you doing? That was like that was valuable. There was, there was money in that. Why would you just wreck something like that? And the father looked at him with a smile and said, That was your place setting. <laughs> he said, You go to college, you join the military, you do whatever you got to do, but your days eat at my table for free are over. Now that might be a little harsh. That might be a little harsh. But the dad was trying to communicate that you have some responsibility. There's something you have to do to participate and contribute to, to the family. And moreover, to your own development. And I fear that in this culture, this landfill that we're building on, that's creating leaning people, some of it is because we're teaching them that the whole world revolves around you. That you're the center of everything. In fact, the questions we ask our kids are typically like, are you happy? Are you happy? And we know that that's not what God calls us to be, is happy all the time. God calls us to have joy. But it's not about the kids just being happy. When we teach the kids that they're the center of the universe, we miss the point that everything is centered around God. Because unless... The Lord builds the house. The work of the builder is useless. In Proverbs 27, 17, we read that these arrows, right? Our children are like arrows in the warrior's hand. Here's another thing about arrows. Arrows have to be sharpened. A dull arrow doesn't do much good. Arrows have to be sharpened. And, and we know that uh, in, in the proverb, Proverbs 27 tells us this, that as iron sharpens iron, a brother sharpens a brother. We have a responsibility to be teaching our children wisdom. We have a responsibility to be teaching our children God's word. We have a responsibility to be teaching our children how to pray. We have a responsibility to be teaching our children how to serve. We have a responsibility to be teaching our children how to give. We have a responsibility to, to make sure that our sons and daughters know, hey, my favorite Bible verses, hey, my favorite Bible stories, my favorite experiences with God. We have a responsibility to let our, our kids see our Bibles that are indeed highlighted with yellow and orange and underlined and circled and marked up with prayers in the margins. Now, I know some of you moms and dads, and I know this would have been true for my mom and dad at one point, uh, would point out that these are arrows, not boomerangs. <laughs> Give you a minute. <laughs> What's the difference? When you shoot an arrow, it just goes away. When you throw a boomerang, it goes away, but then what happens? It comes back. And uh, I know that for some of your parents, you're like, hey, you don't need to come back. I should have smashed the, uh, the place setting. Here, here's my last point today. Last point is this. Firing an arrow requires vision and aim. When you fire an arrow, you, you don't fire blindly, and you don't just fire haphazardly. You, you, you aim at something, right? And as parents, we have to ask ourselves, what is our vision for our children? What is the vision that I have for my children? What, is, what are we aiming at for our children? And I'll give you a couple of examples here. 
some of you have done such a great job with this, and we're trying to learn from you that have done a great job, and, and we're, we're struggling and trying to, to make our way through it. But teaching our kids how to, how, how, how to serve, how to serve. Um, there's a, a family in the church right now that uh, th they need a great deal of, of lawn care. Their, their lawn needs some work, and uh, they, they can't get out and do it on their own. And so I told the boys, we're, we're going to get out there, and we're going to go over there with some tools, and we're going to do all their lawn work for them. And the boys said, praise the Lord, Father. We love to serve. <laughs> we're like arrows. Yeah. <laughs> Teaching our kids to, to love our neighbors, and not just love our neighbors, but to, to, to just be kind. You know, one of the things I've been doing with the kids who typically gather in my office before church is I kick them out now. About 9.50, I kick them out of my office. Uh, by the way, there aren't that many that gather in there anymore. But uh, I kick them out and I tell them, hey, go bless people. Go find people whose hands you can shake. Go find someone that you can smile at. Go find someone you can welcome. Go find someone you can pray for. And now they don't come to my office. <laughs> but look, they're arrows, right? We gotta, we gotta sharpen them. We gotta aim them at, at something. Um, here, here's just a little petty thing. I don't know if this bothers you. Uh, this, this might not even be worthy of a Sunday. But if, I hate the phrases. I'm good. I'm okay. What happened to no thank you? What on earth happened to that? Hey, can, can I give you some? No, I'm good. Hey, would you like? No, I'm okay. Uh, uh, can, w w would you? No, I'm fine. What happened to? Uh, no, but thank you for asking. You know, no, I, I don't need any, but thank you for the offer, right? And so just, just like aiming our kids at those things that, that are, are good and things that honor the Lord and, and love His people, things like generosity and and and. Here's one that we've been struggling a lot with, and I know some of you have too. And it's making sure that the Sunday gathering is a priority. And look, I told you, I can't preach at you. Like, we're right in it with you. Sunday games and travel and this and that. And uh, we've, we've been having conversations with coaches to let them know that Sunday's off the table for us. You know, if, if you play before 10, we'll try to make it work. If you play after uh, noon, we'll try to make that work. But from 9 until about noon, that time's already that time's already locked up. And uh, look, you you see my family, and so we don't do it perfectly. There have been a few Sundays here and there where uh, there's an out of town tournament or something like that. We're still trying to wrestle with that and navigate it. Um, but we got to have something to aim for, and I got to teach the boys that this is paramount. I mean, it, it would be great if you all make the NBA or the NFL or the Major League Baseball, but the fact is, you got my genes. <laughs> and so you're better off coming to church on Sunday. <laughs> Alright, Sermon 2. <laughs> Elders. It'll be about this short. Worship team, come on up. We told you we were going to let you know, what, what should you see from our, our prospective elders? For a couple weeks, we talked about what is a prospective elder, why are we making this shift at Grace, and essentially you're going to see this. You're going to see prospective elders who are shepherding the church. That is, they're going to be teaching and training shares and in Bible studies. Uh, they'll be praying with and for people, leading prayer times. Uh, that some of them will be preaching on Sunday mornings. They're going to be co-leading ministries. Uh, they're going to be reaching out to people to pray for you, praying even when you don't know about it, visiting people in hospitals, trying to help arrange things like lawn care for folks. All that kind of stuff is stuff that the elders are going to be jumping in on. And we just want you to be watching. Just keep your eyes open for these men to see if they are indeed called by God to shepherd the folks at Grace Fellowship Church. And while there will be times when they do make decisions and they have to uh, help us to, to decide whether we go east or whether we go west, that's not the primary call for the elder. It's not an executive board. It's not a board of directors. They're not responsible for the hiring and firing. They're responsible for shepherding. Part of it is shepherding one another. So there needs to be accountability there. There needs to be health check-ins with one another. And then you should see them active and at work. 
And we want you to be watching so that when the time comes in six months or so, and we bring these men forward to say, will you affirm them as elders? You should be able to say, yes, we've seen them and they're doing a great job and we love them. And yes, or no. But you got to be watching for it to see it. And so that's sermon two. You probably like that one better. Um, <laughs> With that in mind, these next two Sundays, you're going to see two different gentlemen preaching. Uh, one of them is not a prospective elder, but just somebody who uh, is, is biblically wise, uh, is, is uh, a teacher. And we've been talking for years about this opportunity. And he has finally said, yeah, I, 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 want, to, I want to try. And as people who are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, we're going to give him a shot. So next Sunday, I'd ask you all to be very supportive and encouraging of Craig Ashley. Yeah. And in addition to being supportive and encouraging, uh, give him honest and critical feedback uh, in the most loving way possible. And then in two Sundays, uh, you'll have Dan Vastic, who is one of our prospective elders, mm -hmm. and he'll also be teaching. And so over the next six months, you might see some of the faces that you recognize, but not necessarily in this capacity. And so we would just ask you once again, support them, love them, pray for them, give them some critical feedback. Uh, the worship team is going to lead us out with two final worship songs, and we want you to know that our prayer partners are available. There are a couple of people who come forward, uh, they're willing to pray for you, and we'll also have somebody out in the foyer who's willing to pray. By the way, on Father's Day, uh, if you've got anything in your soul where you're still wrestling with a uh, relationship between your and dad, your, your relationship with dad, and maybe he wasn't the greatest or whatever, hey, take it to the Lord. There are people who will pray with you. Take that to the Lord. And if you had a great dad, uh, maybe just give thanks to God that he gave you that dad. Let's stand up and worship. <laughs>